uh, now we start discussion session, but uh, because Dale and Richard are advisors to Rieti, so uh, before going into the discussion, I'd like to report briefly about Rieti's recent research activities on the COVID-19 pandemic. I will share uh, my slide. Up to now, uh, Rieti has issued 12 discussion papers since the outbreak of COVID-19. Uh, Yano-san's presentation today is based on a discussion paper, uh, th this discussion paper. Uh, some of the papers were published in COVID Economics, uh, edited by the CEPL. Uh, Richard uh, took initiative to issue this series of ebook. Uh, we have started many new research projects uh, related to COVID-19, including a new project on the uh, COVID-19 antibody test uh, led by Yano-san. Uh, last month, uh, Keiichiro Kobayashi, uh, he's a program director of Rieti on macroeconomics, and I have edited and published a book on the COVID-19 crisis, uh, titled Economics of the COVID-19 Crisis, uh, published from Nikkei Publishing. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this book is written in Japanese. Uh, and 17 research fails uh, uh, contributed to this book. Uh, this is uh, uh, my explanation about the recent uh, reality activity. Uh, it's time to start a uh, discussion. Uh, first, uh, I will ask some questions to three presenters, and then we go to general discussion, including questions from reality fellows. Uh, my first question, my first question to the presenters is on the policy implications. Uh, Yano-san indicated the influence of political leaders. Uh, nobody denies the importance of having good political leader. Uh, since the U.S. president election will be held in November, and Japan's new prime minister, uh, successor of Shinzo Abe, uh, will be determined in, next month, in the next month. Uh, so it is a pra pra practically very important issue, I think. Uh, my question to Yano-san is, how can we select or make good political leaders? Uh, in addition, Yano-san suggested the importance of social capital. Uh, uh, we'd like to hear how can we improve social capital? Yano-san, could you please respond to my question? Yes, that's a very good question. And uh, what is important is, I think, a process to elect the uh, leaders. And that has to be very democratic. That's the first uh, important factor, to have a good, select a good leaders, especially that will ensure the uh, good behavior of the, uh, I think, leaders once you elect uh, leaders in a proper process or a more de really democratic process. And another thing is the importance of the media. Media has to report or, and watch always how the uh, political leaders uh, act and that and properly correctly uh, provide information to the society. The, uh, by looking at an American situation currently, one of the largest problem is that uh, <clears throat> media's role, media's that role is not very well performed. Some medias are following uh, really dubious uh, stories and so on, and that's a uh, problematic situation. I emphasize the social capital, the importance of social capital. And the social capital is important in the sense that that is the uh, kind of final thing 
to ensure uh, the proper behavior of the government, the proper behavior of political leaders, pro proper behavior of the media. And that's the, uh, my answer. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, this question basically to Yano-san, but uh, uh, if Dale or Richard have any uh, comment on this issue, uh, please uh, uh, say something. On political e leaders, well, I mean, it's, uh, we could just hope for the best. <laughs> I, I, I like the, um, the saying that democracy is the worst of all system except for all the others. Uh -huh. uh, so eventually people will figure out that they, that competency and leadership is really important. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so I, I'm, I just, I, I'm not sure there's anything we can do to influence that. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not really a, a, an easy thing to do. Mm -hmm. The only thing I, I think we can do is try and, and I've been very impressed by the amount of data-based policy analysis on COVID that's happened almost instantly. Uh, and and we've we've learned a huge amount about what works with lockdowns and doesn't and lots of lots of things. So I think that's the only thing that economists can do is keep putting in good analysis. And it's almost I mean the world has been running natural experiments for us. Different countries trying different things, but with the real time data we have now, people can can figure out what, what's going on. So that's the only thing I think we as economists can do. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, the next question is uh, mainly to uh, the Professor Dale Jorgensen. Uh, I think that the uh, issue that we need to uh, focus on is the change in technology which is taking place in dealing with the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. This is something that uh, has uh, been a, an intense focus on the part of uh, people who were engaged in uh, drug development uh, around the world, but uh, in uh, major uh, development uh, laboratories, uh, especially in England, uh, but also in the United States. And uh, we need to follow this very closely. Is it uh, the case that these uh, developments are going to mature and uh, the whole nature of the threat of the uh, coronavirus is uh, going to uh, change perhaps as early as uh, the end of this year. I think that's uh, very likely and uh, is something we need to uh, consider and uh, discuss. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and and uh, uh, Professor Jor Jorgensen uh, stated that uh, currently the short and medium term world economic performance is highly uncertain. And uh, you showed uh, the IMF world economic outlook uh, that presented three alternative growth forecasts, uh, baseline, pessimistic, pessimistic, and optimistic scenarios. Uh, which scenario do you think most likely? Uh, I think that uh, I'm an optimist as far as uh -huh. development of technology uh -huh. is concerned. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, it's likely to uh, be uh, developing uh, and uh, ready for implementation, uh, maybe as early as the uh, beginning of next year. Uh -huh. Now, of course, as I uh, emphasized in my presentation, mm -hmm. there's a great deal of uncertainty mm -hmm. associated with the uh, projections. Mm -hmm. And I tried to bring that out by uh, considering uh, the two uh, logical uh, cases where uh, the um, development is very slow and where the development is uh, very rapid. Uh, as this plays out, I think uh, we're going to uh, learn a good deal. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is uh, of central importance to the development of the world economy. Mm -hmm. uh, that is uh, something which has uh, been uh, greatly uh, depressed uh, as a result of the uh, coronavirus and uh, is something that uh, could continue to be depressed or alternatively uh, could give way to uh, a situation where the uh, developments return to uh, what we had before the coronavirus. So uh, I think we need to uh, study this uh, very carefully and I'm glad that Reedy is uh, focusing attention on this issue. Uh, uh, you uh, mainly uh, focus on short-term economic outlook. But, uh, uh, how can we mitigate the negative impact of COVID-19 on long-term economic growth. I'd like to hear uh, 
uh, your view as an expert of economic growth. And if possible, uh, could you please make advice to the next prime minister of Japan? Yeah, so my advice to the next prime minister of Japan mm -hmm. is that uh, Japan is now experiencing uh, a uh, slowdown mm -hmm. that is associated with the uh, developments of technology that we've been discussing. And uh, that, uh, in fact, uh, could uh, be replaced. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, very important in uh, designing policies mm -hmm. for the future development of Japan to uh, follow these developments and uh, understand exactly what the implications are for Japanese economic growth. Mm -hmm. So I'm an optimist. I think that uh, mm -hmm. Japanese economic growth is uh, going to uh, revive, mm -hmm. of course, uh, subject to the uh, uh, very unusual uh, demography that uh, is familiar to everyone here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, next, I'd like to ask uh, Professor Baldwin. Uh, you made a stimulating presentation about the post-COVID-19 economy. I think uh, globotics uh, or telemigration uh, will help some developing nations to catch up advanced economies, as you mentioned. However, uh, you mentioned a uh, new backlash. Uh, so, robotic, ro robotics trend may worsen economic inequality within uh, advanced countries. Uh, so, how do you think the impact of robotics on inequality, and how can we tackle the expansion of economic inequality arising partly from robotics and telemigration? Mm. Thank you. Very good questions. So uh, I am very worried about the implications for inequality uh, because of uh, globotics in general. In other words, office automation mm -hmm. and office offshoring. Mm -hmm. And I think the idea that people are getting used to working remotely. Mm -hmm. Many, many Americans and Europeans mm -hmm. think it's a good idea to re re work remotely, mm -hmm. but very soon their companies will understand that they can replace at least some of them mm -hmm. for one tenth of the price or one twentieth of the price mm -hmm. with online workers. Mm -hmm. And that will then lead to a great deal of insecurity. And that's the backlash that I'm worried about. The inequality is that is, it's, a, it's, a, it's not as clear as with manufacturing, because in manufacturing, the automation and the offshoring was essentially biased against uh, unskilled workers. Whereas with, with this, whether you're in finance and insurance or whether you're in retailing, it, these things can, can, can affect you. So all different skill levels. But for the inequality, I would just to focus a little bit more on, on COVID is I think education is a real problem, that there's a number of uh, young people who are missing out on one or two years of the crucial education. And on top of it, as, as it's written up all the time, but I, I think all of us have personal experiences, that people who are well-to-do can insulate the young children from the damage done by remote teaching. It, whereas uh, people who are less fortunate have small apartments, Maybe themselves have to leave work. They can't send home school. So that achievement gap is, is widening. Uh, and one or two years of a gap like that can have very long lasting implications. So I think the first would be to focus on making sure that the education damage doesn't, doesn't it gets reversed through whatever, you know, summer schools or extra teaching or whatever. The second is this idea of retraining um, for, or income support for people who lose their job. And I think w one of the things that COVID has done, which is great, is it's made it clear that governments are responsible for mass firings of people. They have to support the people with income support, with w whatever they need to keep going. And all around the world, the com companies, that, the countries that could afford it have helped the workers make, the ch uh, make this radical change. Now, you know, the, the debt, gov corporate debt, government debt is going up, and so pretty soon we're going to find that money's not free anymore. But the, the basic idea that the governments should help people jobs, I think that has had a big jump forward. And, and ultimately, there's nothing different about this globalization and the others. People will have to change jobs. It's just a lot faster. 
And in many ways, because it's in the service sector, it's a little bit easier because service sector skills tend to be more fungible. There's a set of skills you need to work in an office, and it doesn't really matter whether you're in insurance or pharmaceuticals or whatever, uh, the same skills. So it's possible that they can be re, 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 redeployed. Mm -hmm. So basically, watch out for education and help with retraining. Those would be my two recommendations to reduce the inequality aspects. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Yano-san, do you have any view about this issue, in inequality and the human, uh, human capital issue? Uh, if I, one point I think uh, by listening to Richard's presentation is that the, it's true that the, the COVID as well as the technological progress will, I think, make world larger or more interconnected with the rest of the, uh, very, very far away in a remote world. And at the same time, I, I think, although I'm an economist, I'm currently into a political science. And uh, in that respect, I think uh, uh, this COVID as well as uh, uh, the technological progress contributes to a fragmentation. So both aspects exist at fragmentation and integration. Integration with the rest of the world, in the way much closer to work with India, much closer to work with China, and so on and so forth. And that's a big factor. And on the other hand, it's much more, uh, this, or, this integration will become, will be, well, but this integration problem will be arising much more rapidly, as uh, Richard pointed out that you know, education is one of the big problem. And if you are wealthier, you can kind of support your children with the personal services uh, while they are taking the, uh, the online schoolings. But if you are not wealthy enough, or you, both of your parents are working, it's very difficult to take care of uh, your children. And that's a really serious issue. I think it's uh, not very easy to overcome. And that will contribute to a kind of fragmentation, which I thought, I think uh, Richard is also worrying about. And uh, these kind of aspect can only mend by, I think, uh, good leadership together with uh, you know, deep thinking uh, towards the, uh, producing a more coherent society. And that's the kind of thing which we, are, we need to find out. It, even though it's a difficult question and it's difficult to achieve, but I think uh, as a social scientist, not just an economist, but from the viewpoint of social science, I think uh, we should look into the, uh, this, what can put the world together in this type of the world. I think it's a newly developing. That's what I felt by listening to uh, Richard's presentation. Thank you very much. Dale, do you have any uh, comment on this issue? Uh, I heard that uh, Harvard University is physically closed and uh, all classes are conducted online. Uh, so how do you evaluate such practice from the viewpoint of quality of education? Well, I think that uh, this is a situation reflecting the uh, way in which the uh, coronavirus has uh, been handled uh, to date. Uh, once uh, this uh, comes under uh, better control, there will be uh, a lot less uh, concern about the uh, issues uh, around the coronavirus. And uh, universities, including Harvard, will move in the direction of a uh, more uh, uh, conventional uh, set of developments. And that will enable a uh, university to take advantage of the kind of uh, technological developments that Richard has emphasized in his uh, presentation. So I think we're in for some big changes, and uh, it's uh, unclear the uh, direction that 
this is likely to go and how uh, fast it's going to uh, carry. But as I said before, uh, I'm an optimist about these uh, technological developments, and I think they're going to lead us away from the uh, problems that have arisen as a result of this uh, coronavirus uh, issue. Uh, now, now I, I'd like to uh, ask questions collected from uh, our EAP fellows. And uh, most uh, questions are concentrated to uh, Richard. Uh, first question is from uh, uh, Dr. William Sobeck. Uh, he asks, what countries have comparative advantage in producing white color robots? In other words, uh, my interpretation is that what type of countries gain most from robotics? Okay, so let me, let me just uh, address that. Thank you, William, for the question. Um, comparative advantage in white color robots. So one of the leading, I mean, for, first of all, white collar robots are essentially about gathering data on tasks that service uh -huh. workers are doing now mm -hmm. and training a machine algorithm through machine learning to do that same task. Mm -hmm. So white collar robots are inevitably fairly local um, because the data is fairly local. Mm -hmm. but, but one country that's doing very well is India. So the uh, traditional back office out like call centers and IT and all that to India. The companies that, that did that, Infosys, saw this trend coming, replacing physical offshoring with white collar robots. And they have developed robotic process automations and solutions like that and use the contact with their networks in order to start to substitute. And they're laying off workers in India and hiring people because you need some people locally with these white collar robots uh, because in the end, it's, you know, it's a, every service job is slightly different. So you need some, so you need a human behind the AI. So they, they're doing it. But um, uh, then the, the big platforms are like Blue Prism is a British company. Um, obviously, there's lots of American companies doing it. And to a certain extent, a lot of it is just shot through everything. So if you, I don't know if you've been updating your Word and your Excel spreadsheets and your Outlooks, they're starting to do amazing things. I can translate my emails into French. I mean, our, our school is half French, half English. I can translate them just by right clicking. And uh, also now my word is doing copy editing. It's, it's telling me whether my sentences are wordy or not. And uh, the PowerPoint suggests designs. So instead of having to do a PowerPoint and then giving it to the design department, it suggests it right there. So a lot of this automation is actually just going right through all the big software companies. So I think to, apart from India, which I think is people I didn't think about, maybe England where Blue Prism and a number of places like that are advanced, it's just the big tech companies. And then after that, it really depends upon the area. I think American banks are very far ahead on robo financial advisors. And in Britain, they're far ahead on medical advisors. There's an app called Babylon Health that's approved by the NHS it because of the backlogs. So it, it depends upon the country. Uh, another question to Richard is from uh, uh, Yuki Hashimoto. Uh, she's a researcher in labor economics. Uh, he, her question is, is the strict Japanese regulation on the dismissal of regular employees likely to be an obstacle in dealing with robotics? Well, more generally, uh, how do you think a good labor market policy in the era of robotics? Um, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question, uh, but let me, let, me an no, let me answer the question that I hope she asked. Uh, yes. <laughs> so, uh, and, and that is, uh, there's, two, there's two elements of it. Some labor market regulation makes offshoring impossible, mm -hmm. and a lot of uh, regulation makes the, putting the data in the cloud also infeasible. So in Switzerland, for example, we have very strict bank secrecy laws. So there is no outsourcing of back office jobs outside of Switzerland because people go to jail if that data gets released. So it's a very strong regulation that's against it. Uh, the second part is um, a lot of the regulation is irrelevant when the value chain disintegrates. So a great deal of our regulation in the labor markets is based on traditional jobs that require you go to the office, you work for one employer, for example. And as that, if we go to the gig economy and the sort of service value chain disintegrates, people are doing different bits in 
in uh, forms, labor market forms that didn't that aren't really regulated. So I think a lot of the stuff that's going to be offshored and outsourced is already escaping labor market regulations. Just to give you the example of Uber, for example, they 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 pretend that these people are not their employers, employees. So none of the la labor employee laws apply to them. So that's a, that's a, that was that would not have been possible if they were driving taxi cabs because you know they they were employed by the taxi cab company. So that's 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 uh, that's the answer to the question. I hope she I hope she was asking. Yeah, thank you, Rats. Uh, uh, unfortunately, time passes very quickly. So uh, finally, I'd like to ask the participants to make some fi final brief remarks, uh, including. Uh, suggestion for Rieti's research. Uh, could you start, uh, uh, Professor Jorgensen? Well, I've uh, tried to emphasize the fact that I think that the uh, development uh, and the implementation of uh, technologies that will uh, deal with the coronavirus is a uh, central issue and uh, needs uh, further uh, consideration. So I think that's uh, consistent with everything that we have uh, said in this symposium. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, Reedy's uh, development of uh, programs that will be effective, including the one that uh, will be directed by uh, Professor Yano. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Richard, please. So let me just, just make two quick ones. So one of the things we've seen, um, and, and we have a lot of it on Vox and also COVID economics, um, is the epidemiological models were viewing humans as if they were molecules. Mm -hmm. And what has happened is behavioral economics and incentives have been combined with epidemiological models to get more realistic models of how the, the disease spread will be influenced by policy. Mm -hmm. And so I, that, they've made a start on that. But I think that's an entire new field of economics. Mm -hmm. And although I agree with, with Dale, eventually, technology will take care of COVID, uh, many people are saying that actually these things, maybe not as big, but are, are coming out. We did have SARS, we had Ebola, for example, MERS. So uh, it's not the last time. But on that particular, most of this integration of economics and epidemiological studies models have been done by Anglo-Saxon economists who have a very individualistic view. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the reason things have gone on so differently in East Asia than they did say in Brazil is because one is a communitarian society and one's an individualistic society. So I suspect the models in which you integrate behavior should be different for, for different countries. And, and that might be one interesting thing. The second thing is kind of more, nothing to do really with COVID, is that if Biden wins the presidency, there will be very exciting times in trade. So I suspect there'll be all sorts of opportunities to remove the trade barriers and renegotiate entry of America into TPP to fix the appellate body. And I wonder if Reiti couldn't do some wargaming or collective thinking as to how that could happen. What's the order? What should be taken together? What issues put together? Which institutions would lead? Which governments would be interested? And it could be kind of a cooperative thinking with people from think tanks of several major countries to see if there is that has happened. Uh, given the um, get, given the world is changed and will stay changed, but if Biden wins, thank you very much. Uh, Yano-san, could you please make final remarks? Well, I think the uh, current state of the world, so many people are dying, so many people are sick, is really sad. And by looking at the uh, Fortunately, in Japan, we are doing relatively well. By looking at the, uh, the rest of the world, Europe, America, and so on and so forth, and many, many people are suffering. And it's painful to look at those sufferings. But at the same time, by looking at those sufferings, I feel that the huge challenge we have to really start right now to overcome this situation. And that's the very important thing we have to start. And through this overcoming this big problem and doing very difficult tasks to uh, get over this problem, 
I think we will have a rather paradoxically speaking, it is an exciting moment to fight with this really serious problem we are currently facing. So uh, final thing I would like to say is be courageous and be challenging to go against the uh, uh, pandemic right now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, it's time to close the session. Uh, thank you very much, Dale and uh, Richard, for your participation and insightful discussion today. Uh, I'd like to uh, see and discuss you again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>